everybody, and thank you so much for this um, this invitation. It's really a pleasure to talk to you about my my work. Um, so, hello from New York City. Um, I'm sorry about those those technical issues. So, I uploaded the um, the PowerPoint file, and it looks like the text might be a little funny. Um, I just sa saved as a PDF if we need to re-upload, but hopefully, we'll be okay. Um, yeah, so I want to talk to you about one of my projects on um, modal verbs in language development and language change. Um, let's see. Oh, no, it looks good. Okay. A little bit of squishing, but I'm sure we can manage. Um, so modal verbs are, um, in English, uh, some examples are like must, could, should, um, and I'll give some other examples for you. Um, so like in French, you'd have like pouvoir and devoir, and in Dutch, the cognate to must is uh, mutton, um, which I've also done some work on. I probably pronounced it wrong, but... Um, but these uh, modal verbs in um, Indo-European languages, um, and a little bit in some other languages families, but definitely widespread in Indo-European, they have a, what I'm going to call variable meaning. Um, you could also call this polysemy. So they, you have one form, one verb, but it has more than one uh, distinct uh, meaning. Um, and we're going to be focusing on must in particular, um, because that's the, the modal verb that we um, we studied experimentally that um, and the experiment uh, work I'm going to focus on. Um, so looking at examples from must, um, we see that it has both what we call deontic meanings, uh, and deontic uh, meaning kind of uh, associated with rules or norms, um, and it has epistemic meanings, ones that are associated with um, knowledge or evidence-based inferences. Um, and I just want to, before I walk you through the examples, I want to flag your attention to the syntax. So the kind of constructions that this verb occurs in affect how speakers prefer to interpret it or how they can even interpret it in some cases. Um, and this is what we make, take advantage of in our experiment. Okay, so with a bare verb, so uh, following the modal, um, this is Dinosaurio. This is from my child language lab. He's our little mascot. So Dino, Dinosaurio. Um, so if we say dinosaurio must eat lots of leaves, this is following um, the modal uh, auxiliary verb in English with the bare verb eat. Um, and here you can get um, both interpretations quite easily. So dinosaurio must eat lots of leaves because his vet said so, you know, it's good for his health, it's a requirement, it's an obligation. That's the deontic interpretation of must. But we could also interpret this epistemically. Oh, dinosaurio must eat lots of leaves because the trees around his cave are bare. Right. And here it's related to my me as a speaker, my inference about what I what I know about Dino and what I I'm uh, I want to signal, I think, is true. Um, so these are two different readings of must. Um, and in this case, we can get two different readings for the exact same sentence, the exact same string. But English also allows you to uh, modify the main verb um, with grammatical aspect marking. Um, so, uh, and there's two different grammatical aspect markings um, that we uh, that we made use of. One is perfect marking, so instead of eat, have eaten, um, or progressive marking, like be eating. And so now, if you use this, um, basically the same um, prejacent, so the same unmodalized um, sentence, but we add in this aspect marking, you get dinosaurio must have eaten, or dino must be eating. And in these cases, um, speakers very readily get an epistemic reading. Uh, oh, so he must have eaten. The food's gone. He must have eaten. Um, or, oh, he must be eating. Like, I, I can't see it, but I can hear it. So I can make this inference that he's eating. Um, and so when we use must in combination with grammatical aspect marking, there is a much, much, much stronger likelihood of just getting that epistemic interpretation, the one that's about an inference from knowledge. Um, and this has to do with um, manipulating the tense and aspect of the sentence. Um, and um, the obligation one, the deontic one, what, what does it mean for an obligation to hold in the past or in the present? Obligations are about what you need to do from, from this point forward. So, so you can really only get that obligation reading that deontic reading, when the, the force of that modal must is about the future. He must eat lots of leaves from this point forward for his health, says the veterinarian, right? Um, so by manipulating other aspects of the syntax that relate to tense and aspect, you can, you can push how we interpret these variable meaning or polysemous modal, modal verbs. 
Um, and this is what we uh, exploit in our experiment. We want to know, do kids know this um, when they're learning modals? And how does this uh, relate to how modals change over time uh, with respect to their interpretations? Ooh, this got a little squashed. Um, Maybe, can I try, I'm gonna try uploading my PDF because it won't be squashed. I know that's a bit annoying because we're already behind, but I can kind of talk while we do this. Um, and I was also wondering, um, do, um, if anyone has any questions, is it quite uh, straightforward to just raise your hand or, like I, I can't see people, so. so normally we, uh, we let uh, the questions be asked in the end. Absolutely, yeah. And usually because uh, some people can only, I don't know uh, how um, their different statuses or so, but some people can only um, type in the chat and then uh -huh, read okay. the chat and read out the questions for you. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to flag if um, if any, if there was any like clarification while I go, um, you could let me know, but um, okay. Um, I, will, I will watch the chat. Perfect. And um, just because I, I'd rather people really understand what I do present than if I go through and um, um, and I made the uh, the presentation a bit um, longer in case we had time or I wanted to jump towards um, something later. Um, and I'll post it on my website after um, so that if people have further questions, you can you can go look at and further materials, you can go ahead and look. OK, look, this is perfect. The PDF has, has it all lined up nicely. OK, good. Um, so what do we see in language change and why did we pick must to look at um, in our um, developmental study where we wanted to see if children might be playing a role in how languages change. Well, modals in general, general modal verbs are very well studied um, from a historical perspective. We know quite a lot about them, especially in English and related languages. Um, and they show, um, critically, they show these directional patterns of change. So we have some idea of what's coming next or what tends to happen in a certain order so that we can study children now and see, are they doing something that looks like the next step in language change? Um, so modal verbs show these directional um, syntactic and semantic changes in the historical record, which I've schematized, um, simplified and schematized in this um, diagram here. Um, and so the syntax, the syntactic changes that we see uh, appear to be discrete. We can think of them about innovations, like a new way of saying something um, in the history of the language um, and changes in what kinds of words do what work. Um, and then the semantic changes are, the, so the meaning changes are a little, a little fuzzier. So we, they seem to be a bit more gradual and more about how are people using the forms that are available to them in the language. Um, at that stage in the language's history. Um, so modal verbs, what we see is they um, originate as lexical verbs. Um, so I'll give you an example that is um, really uh, beautifully parallel in English and French. So in French, uh, the verb we care about is devoir, um, and it used to only mean to owe money, and it still means that, right? <laughs> it still has that really old meaning. And in English, the modal verb um, shall, which I don't even use ever. I think it's, it's basically uh, at this lost stage for me and for many North American English speakers. Also used to mean in um, uh, Germanic and in, in like proto-West Germanic, used to mean to owe money. Both of them became reanalyzed re from these really lexical verbs, meaning to owe money, into modal verbs in both of those languages in both English and French, and they started to have just an obligation meaning. And you can see how that relationship holds, right? Like if you owe money, you have some kind of obligation. And then they became reanalyzed as modal verbs in their, um, uh, in their meaning, and they just gained these kind of plain obligation meanings. And then eventually they also gained epistemic meanings. And that's the order we see. You get mo you get lexical verbs reanalyzed as modal verbs, but once they're modal verbs, they first have this deontic meaning, like the obligation meaning for devoir or shall or must. Um, and then later in the historical record, we see them being used epistemically. Um, so you get this syntactic reanalysis where they change their verb type. Um, and once they're modal verbs, we see a change, um, a gradual change. Like initially we see them just with deontic or other root 
modal uses, like ability maybe or permission, um, and then very gradually epistemic. And here's where we see, so this is what we really, really care about. We have a modal verb like must, and it has more than one meaning. I'm using purple for deontic consistently and green for epistemic consistently. It initially shows up in the historical record with, um, with uh, just the deontic uses and then and very few epistemic but gradually over time it comes to be used almost exclusively as epistemic and then we also see that the more epistemic it gets the less people are using this verb overall so what's happening um, in english um, in english as across the world is the older meaning of must totally still exists. I can still say you must brush your teeth, um, but it sounds really formal and old fashioned. And it's become re replaced more and more by have to. You have to brush your teeth. And this is why we call this cyclic change. As one modal moves along this path, another one hops in and starts doing the same, doing um, taking over the older uses. So we get this cycle of change in, in modals. Um, and so our question is, uh, do kids kind of push this along? Are they drivers of change in this cycle? Um, okay. And why ask about kids as drivers of change? Well, I, I think they're an interesting intuitive source of language change because each little human must learn, um, must learn their own language from indirect evidence uh, from speakers around them. So it's not that they get to know what exactly is happening in mommy's head, right? Rather, they hear what she says and they have to, her and everyone else around them, and they have to um, infer or um, do abductive reasoning and figure out, you know, what's this grammar? What am I learning, right? So each little kid needs to do this anew and we're all very, very creative um, learners. Um, so it's a very compelling place to look. And in fact, um, change theories about why languages change and why they change the way that they change have appealed to child learners for, you know, over a hundred years now. Um, so children um, learning their first language or first languages um, have been suggested as the source of innovation. So the source of new uh, forms or new constructions in the language um, and have also been appealed to for the direction of incrementation. And incrementation is the name of that process of gradual shift in meaning where you get more and more of the newer uh, meaning uh, in, in usage patterns. So let me just step back a sec. Incrementation is this process where you have a modal verb, it has more than one meaning, but over several centuries um, for modals and for some other domains of language maybe faster, you get a gradual shift away from use, the older usage and towards the newer usage. So more and more, in the case of a modal verb, more and more epistemic uses. Um, so we are gonna focus primarily on incrementation um, in, this, uh, in this talk and in this, uh, and, and given the experiment that we ran. Um, and incrementation is the increase in frequency, extent, scope, or specificity of an innovative variant. So this has mostly been um, proposed and talked about in the sociolinguistic literature. Um, um, so mostly by William uh, Lebov and colleagues and um, mostly for sound change. But for us, we're looking at a, a syntactic semantic um, uh, phenomenon and um, the increase in frequency, extent, scope or specificity of the innovative variant is essentially the increase in use of uh, epistemic must over geontic must. So epistemic must arises later in the historical record. It's newer in the history of the language and it's been in gradually increasing in its usage. And that interplays um, with other aspects of the language. Like now, um, a speaker like me using must, I mostly use epistemic must, which means it's mostly used with a grammatical aspect marking. And we've seen this when we look at corpora of natural speech. Um, people, people often say, oh, it must be raining, or, oh, I must, have, I must have already paid that bill. And so people are using must a lot, but very often with grammatical um, aspects, so perfect or progressive marking. Um, so there's more going on than just must being, must itself being used more epistemically. It's interacting with the rest of the grammar 
um, in accordance with that change. Um, so Lebov, um, in, in his discussion of incrementation, this process, he says successive cohorts and generations of children advance a change beyond the level of their caretakers and role models. Um, so he proposes that um, children are the ones who increment the change, who push it a little further, like who use more and more the innovative variant. So it's not the case that they create something completely new. They just change the frequency so that there's more and more epistemic um, being used. However, um, this hasn't been demonstrated in child language. Um, there's some sociolinguistic work that suggests that it could be possible, um, but it really hasn't been demonstrated in child language and, um, and not at all um, for syntactic or semantic um, change patterns. Um, so the major question for this research is, do ch child learning patterns and do things that children actually do in their developmental pathway, do they feed diachronic incrementation? Are children diverging from adult speakers in their community in ways that are consistent with what we know about language change, such that we could say, look, it, it does in fact look like children are doing the kinds of things that we expect them to do if they are the drivers of language change. So there's a lot of background before I get to the study, but now we must talk a little bit about what do kids, what do, kids do? What do we know about children um, and the acquisition of modal verbs? Um, so what we know is that children begin to use modal verbs around age two, um, and they use them with their root meanings. And root meanings includes the deontic meanings. It also includes ability or permission, uh, which is another kind of deontic meaning, or, um, or their goals, you know, what you can do. Um, um, in order to achieve a goal. Um, and then epistemic uses follow afterwards. So just like in the history of languages where we tend to see uh, modal verbs arise first with their uh, root meanings, including those deontic meanings, and then a little later with epistemic, we see the same thing um, in children. Um, however, it's not the case that children don't have the ability um, to think epistemically, and that's why they start with the, the root meanings. Um, and I say that because that's been suggested quite a lot in the prior literature. Um, but we know from non-linguistic implicit measures, so these psycholinguistic, uh, psycho, psychological, developmental psychological, psychological tasks, um, that even really young infants seem to be able to um, entertain um, many different kinds of modal reasoning, um, both, uh, both deontic and epistemic. Um, uh, so I just wanna flag that for, for you. Um, so, um, so really, but really we're talking about children's grammatical development and what, uh, what grammatical pieces, what words, what constructions they use to express these kinds of meanings. Um, and early on kids, um, actually use maybe um, very early on, um, e even when they're not using epistemic modal verbs. Um, okay, so young children's productions of uh, modal verbs in general, um, but must in particular are root biased. Um, so they tend to use must um, from uh, mid age two, two and a half, um, and their uses of must actually tend to be mostly, um, mostly deontic. And this is interesting because their parents are using it mostly epistemically. So um, very young kids are actually showing a very strong deontic bias. Um, and here's an example from uh, the Manchester corpus from the child John. Um, and here he is two years, eight months old. The child says, it's got mud over it. It's got mud over it. And the mom says, I see, right. And the child says, must wash it. And this means like, we have to wash it. We are obliged to wash it, right? Um, and there he's two years, eight months. Um, and just a month later, we see him use must with its epistemic uh, meaning. Uh, the child says, my yellow one, can't see it, must be gone. And here it's not about an obligation, it's about the child's inference about what happened to his, um, his toy, his yellow, the yellow toy. Um, and so even though we see this super, super consistently that kids first use modal verbs with their root meanings and only later with their epistemic, I want to also show you that, show you that even for um, the modal verb must, uh, 
to a child under three years old is using that word um, with both its meanings, which is a really um, impressive because what it means is this child has already figured out that this one form must has more than one semantic uh, interpretation. Um, and so the kids that we study are, um, um, we chose to study children three and older, partly because children younger than three require different tasks. They um, aren't able to do explicit game based um, language acquisition tasks. Um, but also uh, because we know from our corpus work, um, um, and this is work I've collaborated with uh, several people, we know from our corpus work that by age three English learning children um, have command over both meanings of, uh, of these modal verbs. And so we want to ask, are they doing anything that looks like incrementation where choosing one meaning over the other, the epistemic meaning, more often um, than adult speakers in their community? Okay, so um, this research was all conducted on Toronto English speakers. So this is a variety of Canadian English. Um, and um, it's in most respects like other dialects of English. Um, so the modal usage is in a prolonged flux. Um, so that is that there has been change in progress in the modal system in the, in the language, um, in English in general and in Toronto English in, in particular, um, where, um, where must is becoming more and more epistemic and its geontic uses are being taken over by have to and got to. Um, but a nice thing about Toronto English is also that it's been really well studied, um, by uh, sociolinguists, Tagliamonte and Darcy, um, particularly uh, for must usage. So we actually have some facts about how um, that these models are used in the, the community where we're st we study children. Um, so must remains variable meaning for adult speakers. Um, so that means people are using it both um, with its deontic uses and its epistemic uses, but deontic uses of must are proportionally very few um, about 2% of the deontic necessity uses. So of time speakers need to express a deontic necessity, so an obligation, only 2% of the time do they use must. The rest of the time they're using have to or got to. Um, an epistemic must though is pretty robust. So speakers in, um, in the community are using epistemic must pretty often. It's for, oh, it must be raining, that must be the bailman at the door, he must have eaten his dog food. Um, they're using it about 55% of the time they want to express epistemic necessity. They're also using have to. Um, so if the doorbell rings, people can also say, oh, that has to be the doorman. Um, uh, and this is all, um, these stats are all from sociolinguistic interviews. So just like natural conversations, spoken language conversations. Um, have to has taken over most of the deontic necessity uh, uses. So most obligations in the dialect are expressed via have to, so about 72%. Um, and the and have to is also variable meaning. So it also has epistemic uses. So you can see, if you think about my little diagram with the change over progress, uh, must is really further along diachronically. It's being used primarily epistemic. And have to is just behind. Um, it's being used mostly um, with the purple meaning, so the geontic meaning, and, and less often with epistemic. So our question is, what meanings do preschool Torontonians, so preschoolers, um, age three to six, what meanings do they have for must, and how does um, the way they hear must, um, what syntactic construction it's in, um, how does that affect their interpretation of must? Uh, and crucially, do they differ from adults in their same speech community in the direction of more epistemic interpretations for the bare modal verb constructions. So these are the dino must eat, bare verb eat, lots of leaves kinds of constructions because these constructions are ambiguous for adults. They can have either um, the deontic interpretation or the epistemic interpretation. Um, so we wanna know do kids more often than adults choose the epistemic interpretation for those of uh, those basically ambiguous constructions, pushing the epistemic interpretation of the of uh, must. Do they advance incrementation? 
Uh, so this is a joint um, project with um, Ana Teresa Perez Larue at the University of Toronto. Um, so we uh, designed a picture preference task comparing root and epistemic interpretations of two different um, sentence types. Um, we had modal only sentences that are variable in their interpretation. So Scott must wear his rain boots. This could either, either be in, in a, he's obliged to wear his rain boots or he must wear his rain boots in general. Uh, it must be something he habitually does, which is an epistemic interpretation. Um, so these modal only sentences are variable interpretation. And then we also had modal aspect sentences um, and modal aspect sentences are the ones with either um, the progressive marking or the perfect marking. Um, Scott must be wearing his rain boots or Jada must have taken a bath. Uh, and when you have this marking, uh, you get an epistemic interpretation. Okay. And our specific hypothesis linked to our um, experiment, um, so we call the incrementation hypothesis, is, is as follows. In ambiguous contexts, so sentences that could be, I, could be interpreted either as deontic or epistemic, and these are our must plus bare verb sentences, must eat, must take a bath, those ones. Children will prefer epistemic interpretations at higher rates than young adults from the same speech community. If children are doing something that's diachronically more advanced, further along in the change in progress, this is how we operationalize incrementation. We expect children um, to prefer epistemic interpretations at higher rates than older speakers from their, own, from their community. Um, competing hypotheses are that children will match adult rates, which is basically that even these young kids are adult-like or that they might have a persistent deontic bias. So remember I mentioned that very, very young kids, two-year-olds, initially start off with using these modal verbs with their root meanings, like deontic meanings, more than, more than adults. Um, if that continues to be the case, um, we would get act exactly the opposite prediction from what the language change prediction is, um, where kids are doing the more conservative thing, using must, like diachronically conservative thing, using must in, with its deontic uses more than adults. So using its older uses more than adults. Okay. So here's how our um, procedure worked. So we had this, um, we had this uh, little computer game that we programmed with MATLAB um, and it was a penguin sharing stories um, from his storybook. And Penguin would first show, um, and the whole screen would be this, Penguin would first show a little intro picture. Um, and we would hear something like, this is Irina. She loves to play in the mud, but she also likes to be clean. So we'd set up the story and you see the little girl there and she's clean in that picture, it's hard to tell. And then Penguin would turn the book back to himself and you'd hear a page turning noise and Penguin would say the test sentence. And we uh, varied, um, so we only said one sentence per story, um, but children heard 16 test stories overall. And eight of the, eight, for eight of the stories, they heard a modal only sentence. So for this item, it would be, Irina must take a bath with must followed by a uh, bare verb. Or they would have heard, Irina must be taking a bath with a uh, progressive aspect marking. So. Eight of the stories they heard aspect marking, eight they heard the modal only. There was always a must in the sentence. And Penguin always said the test sentence when Penguin had the book facing himself so you couldn't see. And then Penguin went, see, look, and showed you the two pictures. And we asked the child, which picture was Penguin looking at? So basically we asked the child to show us how they interpreted the test sentence that Penguin um, said. And one of the pictures corresponded to a deontic interpretation. So this girl is covered in mud here. She must take a bath. Um, and here we see her clothes on the floor and we see that the bath is, you know, full of water and the curtains are drawn. This is the target uh, picture for she must be taking a bath. Is that clear? How it works? So, so we, we 
always had two pictures and they heard one sentence and we wanted them to show us how they interpreted uh, the sentence by picking the picture that matched their interpretation. Okay. And so there was three training items, 16 test items, and eight fillers um, in a fully randomized order. Um, and we counterbalanced um, which side the pictures appeared on. So half the time and at random across the items, they saw the Deontic picture on the left and half on the right. Mm -hmm. Our participants were uh, 54 monolingual English children uh, born and raised in the Toronto area, um, divided into three groups. So we had uh, 17 three-year-olds, 18 four-year-olds, and 19 five or six-year-olds. Um, these were mostly in the five to six age range, but a few of them were over six. Um, and then we had 10 dialect matched young adult controls um, with no exposure to a second language before um, age seven. And here are our results. Okay. I, I'm like really proud of these figures, but I have to show you how to read them. <laughs> so these figures are, um, each dot is an individual speaker and their performance on our, um, on our study. Um, and remember they saw eight stories um, where they heard the modal only sentence. So the must take a bath sentence. So that's our um, Y axis. And they also heard eight stories with um, modal aspect sentences. So the must have eaten or must be taking a bath um, sentences. I've collapsed those together. There was no, um, there was no real difference between the perfect and the progressive. We looked because we had four of each. Uh, it wasn't, um, it wasn't significant. Um, so what we're seeing here is three-year-olds are this plot, four-year-olds are this plot, five-year-olds are this plot, and here are adults. And what we have is for each speaker, how many times on the y-axis of, of the eight modal only sentences they heard, how often did they pick the epistemic picture? This is plotting, how often did you choose the epistemic picture? Um, and then on the x-axis for the modal aspect sentences, how often did you pick the epistemic picture? So let's look at adults first. So that's this, um, this box here. And here, if somebody's dot was here where my red dot is right now, it would mean that they chose zero epistemic pictures uh, the whole time. But actually what we see for adults is a very consistent um, that when they hear the modal aspect sentence, they most of the time um, pick seven or eight times they pick the epistemic picture. So when they hear must be taking a bath, they pick the picture uh, where you see the bath. You see the girl in the bath and you just can't directly see her, right? So adult speakers are doing exactly what we expected them to do, which is when they hear the modal must with aspect marking, they, um, they are close to ceiling or at ceiling for choosing the epistemic picture. So uh, many of them being seven, most of them being seven or eight times out of eight picking epistemic pictures when they hear uh, a sentence with aspect in it, modal aspect. Now, the modal only sentence, so the must take a bath, is the one that we um, started off our discussion saying is really either interpretation. You can either get um, the obligation to take a bath, and in which case you'd pick the, the girl covered in mud. She's got to take a bath. She has to take a bath. Um, or you can get the she must you know, the, she must bathe, kind of habitual and epistemic reading. Like, it must be the case that she um, she bathes, and you can get that epistemic interpretation. And you see that our adults vary completely across the entire spectrum. So some adults chose no epistemic pictures at all. They always chose the deontic picture when they heard the bear must sentence, must with the bear verb. Um, but others were at, one was even at ceiling. He chose, he chose epistemic pictures, all eight of the modal only sentences. So adults are very, very clear when they hear modal aspect sentences, they uh, pick epistemic pictures. And when they hear the modal only sentences um, that are, that are variable in their interpretation, they are kind of across the spectrum, um, showing that they do in, indeed interpret it variably. Now, Children, um, unlike adults, adults showed a significant 
distinction by sentence type. Adults make a difference. If you give them the, the sentence with just must take a bath with the bare verb, adults are um, uh, significantly more likely to pick deontic pictures than if you give them modal aspect where um, they are significantly more likely to pick epistemic pictures. So this is a very strong statistical pattern that adults are doing different things depending on which sentence they hear. None of our child groups showed a significant difference by sentence type. Um, this was surprising to us. Um, instead, what we find is for three-year-olds, children clustered down here in this little, this quadrant, which we called our deontic bias um, quadra, deontic dominant, which means three-year-olds most of the time, um, and, and more so than older groups, are more likely to pick the deontic picture, regardless of sentence that they hear. So, um, so our three-year-olds are, but a lot of them are also kind of at chance. So in the four and four center of our, um, of our uh, figure. Um, four-year-olds are kind of across the board, um, um, but five-year-olds, our five and six-year-olds are where we see um, the most interesting result which is basically by the time these children are five years old, they're epistemic dominant. So they're in this upper right quadrant of our um, plot, which is to say that um, these children are picking the epistemic picture most of the time for both sentence types. And some of them are completely at ceiling, 16 out of 16 test items, they pick the epistemic uh, interpretation for the must sentence regardless of whether it's the must uh, bear verb sentence or the must with aspect marking sentence. And when we talk to the, I wanna give you just a little piece of qualitative um, data as well. So when we talk to these children, um, so this is a five-year-old um, and this is the story that I gave you as an example story. Um, the test sentence this child heard was, um, Irina must wash herself. Oh, sorry, this was the wash herself. We, we also had another one about taking bath because cleaning was a very easy one to draw, <laughs> like get the two readings. Um, so Irina must wash herself um, is what the child heard. And remember most adults picked um, this sentence, this picture when they heard that. She must wash herself she's, because she's dirty. Um, but most of the five-year-old children picked the epistemic picture. So they heard Irina must wash herself and they picked this picture. This was the picture that Penguin was talking about when Penguin said, Irina must wash herself. And so we would follow up with the kids. We would say, oh yeah, how do you know? How do you know Penguin was looking at that picture? Um, and some of the kids would give us some informative um, uh, qualitative uh, evidence, right? Um, for, what, for why they chose that picture. And this child said, I can't see her. She's in the water and her clothes is on the floor. Um, and this is a really beautiful explanation of an epistemic um, inference. They're saying, well, she must wash herself right now because she must, for me, I really want to say she must be washing herself, but um, she must wash herself because, because look, um, her clothes are on the floor and um, there's someone in the bath. It must be her, right? And so this is very clearly supporting an epistemic interpretation of the must in the sentence, Irina must wash herself. So uh, summarizing the results from uh, this study, um, adults differentiate modal flavor, so deontic or epistemic by syntax. Um, so the syntactic manipulation in our experiment mattered for adults, um, but it didn't have an effect in any of our child groups. Rather, um, children start with a fairly weak weak deontic bias. Um, so this is kind of in line with that corpus work that we've done on natural child productions, um, that when they're very young, so two and here it seems even at age three, they have a preference for the deontic interpretation. So the obligation interpretation of must. Um, it was a pretty weak preference in our study though, because many of them were appeared at chance, um, but it was, it was significant. Um, and then what we see is by five years old, children have become more adult-like for the modal aspect sentences. So when they're hearing um, must be washing herself or must have eaten, they are becoming more adult-like. They're choosing more and more epistemic 
pictures for those modal aspect marked, um, those aspect marked modal sentences. However, they're also choosing more and more epistemic pictures for the uh, modal only sentence. Um, so they significantly overgenerate epistemic interpretations for modal only sentences. So when they hear, Irina must wash herself or the dog uh, must eat, um, they are picking the epistemic picture um, at significantly higher rates than adults and then younger children. Yeah. And so this is consistent with our hypothesis about um, incrementation for children. Um, so recall that we hypothesize that if children were the drivers of incrementation, and incrementation is the increase in usage um, of the innovative form, and the innovative use of must, when we look diachronically, is the epistemic one. Um, we expected children to have a preference for epistemic interpretations of must, um, above and beyond adult speakers in their speech community. Um, and this is in fact what we found. And you can only see it when there's a choice, when there is variation. You can only see it on the sentences with must where you could have either the obligation, deontic interpretation or the epistemic interpretation. And, and what's quite interesting to us here was that children actually flip biases. So very young children, have this deontic bias, but within a couple of years, they are um, preferring the epistemic interpretation of uh, sentences with must above and beyond adult speakers. Um, so um, how am I for time? I should be wrapping up. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip uh, some of this extra stuff I put in here because we had other um, follow-up um, uh, studies um, that really made it, that were really just there to kind of uh, uh, make sure that the result we found was really about how children are interpreting must. Um, so to summarize, um, we found that five-year-olds pre prefer epistemic interpretations of must for ambiguous spare verb sentences um, above adult rates. Um, and this is consistent with um, children pushing uh, pushing the, the, the diachronic um, directional pathway of change for, um, um, for this particular modal verb. Um, and I just wanna end on this note is, is why? Why might children overgenerate epistemic mass? So we found this directional pattern, it's significant, why? Um, and so one of the things that we think uh, might be very relevant um, for, for English is that epistemic uses of these functional verb modals, so these auxiliary modal verbs like must, are interpreted above tense and aspect um, in the modal syntax. So they're interpreted very high. So here's a, here's a, a scheme, um, a bracketing structure for where we interpret must when we interpret it epistemically. We interpret it above tense and aspect. Um, and when we epistemic, and when we <laughs> interpret it as deontic, we interpret it lower in the syntactic structure. And so the really interesting thing about um, English syntax is that when you have aspect marking, so when you have that have eaten or that be eating with must, must is overtly above the aspect marking. Um, that's not true in the, in the bare verb sentence, um, dino must eat. Then we just have the must, we have no evidence of any tense and aspect marking. English just has a bare verb there. Um, so we don't know which position must is being interpreted in. But when you have aspect marking, so must have, have eaten, you see must overtly above aspect. And we think that possibly once children acquire this aspect of their syntax, they over generate that higher interpretation of must because it's the one that's concretely in their syntax. It's the one that they can be confident about. And we know that learners do show a preference for, for the aligning the semantics with the syntax. So, so you know, if you, if you see must overtly above aspect, you, you'll make an assumption that must is high. Um, so, so we think that probably learning the syntax is what causes the children to overgenerate. Um, the uh, higher interpretation of uh, must. <laughs>
Um, so our main claim is that learning biases, uh, and, and here um, I just very briefly told you which kind here related to syntactic acquisition, um, may feed well-known patterns of language change. Here, the shift from uh, deontic interpretations to more and more epistemic interpretations in the incrementation process. And if you look at some of the other studies we talked about, we also have some evidence for why these might get lost and why kids might be related, uh, play a role in that. Okay, I'll wrap up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So that's the only drawback. We can have a speaker from New York, but we can't have applause. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll first ask the students and other listeners if they have any questions, because I have two or three myself, but uh, I don't want to hog up. Uh, Anneli, thanks for the interesting talk. I've got uh, two small clarification questions and an out of interest question. First, what's the relationship between deontic modality and epistemic modality and epistemic modality and losing modality? So what connects the two so that there uh, is this gradual evolution? Second question, is it just frequency of exposure that makes the children, children uh, biases or is this something in them internal as well? And the out of interest question, question what would have been the lexical meaning of have to? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the I'm, I'm gonna answer the questions in, in reverse, if that. So the lexical like, meaning of have to, so have to um, is uh, related to the possession meaning of having, um, but but have to has um, uh, so many uses in English um, that have grammatically popped up at different uh, times, but, um, but it does trace back to a possession, uh, the possession have to, which English still has. Um, the second question was the one about, oh, is it just about uh, input frequency. Yes, that is an excellent question and something we um, we worried quite a lot about because it may be the case that children start with this um, deontic bias um, because it's more grammatically accessible or because it's more conceptually relevant to them. But then the more they hear English, the more they tune into the fact that, hey, speakers are usually using must epistemically and then they might overshoot because of the input. And that's actually completely consistent. That's a you thought of you thought of one of the problems with our paper. It's completely consistent with um, with uh, the child's experience listening to Toronto English. So I want to show you something real quick. We also did the same study on Bosnia and Serbo-Croatian. So we ran the same study with um, what I'm calling BCS, so Bosnia and Croatian Serbian, in Sarajevo with um, uh, Bosnian children. And BCS, the modal verb morati, is the, is the equivalent to must. And the critical thing to answer your question is we also did a corpus study of uh, morati in the speech directed at children, and it's exactly the opposite to must. Both of these verbs can be used with root, both, root, uh, both deontic meanings and epistemic meanings. And in English, we'd already found that for must, adults are mostly using it epistemically. In BCS, we found that Morati was being used like 95% of the time with its uh, deontic interpretation, with its root interpretations. But we found the exact same results in BCS. Children did the same pattern. Um, so these are um, similar, like the, this is picture, uh, choices of epistemic pictures, and these are six-year-old children. And they also, for the, for the root modal construction in BCS, they also picked mostly epistemic pictures by the time they were six. Um, so, so contrasting those two languages allowed us to answer that question and say, no, it can't just be input frequencies for how these modals are used because we have a language with the exact opposite and in stronger uh, usage bias, but we've got the same effect of kids preferring the epistemic interpretations. Um, and then the first question was about the relationship between yeah, deontic. between um, deontic to epistemic and epistemic to losing modality. Yes, uh, I went pretty quickly through all that and there's like so much that could be said and so much literature on this if you're interested. Um, so a quick answer is um, all of these modal words or modal constructions in language 
have to do with things that aren't actual, that we don't know to be true or false. Um, so deontic is about um, what, what you are allowed or obliged to do. Um, and that means it hasn't happened yet, right? So if I say you must brush your teeth, you haven't brushed your teeth yet. I'm just saying you, you should. You should make it so that that world is true, the one where you do that, <laughs> right? Um, and epistemic is also about something that we don't know to be true. Um, it's about, you know, um, I heard the doorbell ring. I don't know that it's the mailman, but he tends to come this time of day. So, so I think that's the true world, the one where it, it is the mailman. So, um, so on this more abstract um, meaning, they're actually fairly similar. It's just a matter of, uh, they're, so they're both modal meanings, but the, epis, the deontic one is, is about rules and what should happen going forward. Whereas the epistemic one is about what is true. Is it this possibility or this possibility? So um, diachronically, we see um, these uh, lexical verbs with a kind of a, with a modal meaning to them, like owing money, um, becoming bleached to just the general obligation. And then one of the theories is that how you go from that deontic meaning to that epistemic meaning one of the theories, there's a few, but, but one I think is a, that is intuitive is from um, Elizabeth Tragut and uh, Richard Dasher. So they suggest that um, maybe there's a kind of an inference involved. So if you, if you must do something, it implies that you will. So maybe you get this, this, you know, I have this obligation, therefore it will become true. So maybe speakers link this and you, or, or children misinterpret it on the way. They don't suggest that, I suggest that. Um, <laughs> that, um, you know, if you hold an obligation, if you must do something, maybe it will happen. And then I can infer epistemically that something will be true, is likely to be true. Um, so maybe that's that connection. Um, okay, and then loss. So, I'm looking outside and it's actually, it's kind of snowing. I don't know what it's doing. It's like slushing. It's slushing outside. I can say, um, if I, if I wasn't looking outside, so I'm blocking my window, I can't actually see, but someone comes in and they're, they're, you know, they're like wet and they've got a, an umbrella or something. I can say, oh, it, it must be raining, but I can also just as likely not say the must there and just say, oh, it's raining because, you know, my evidence is good enough. Um, so, when we are when we are faced with a situation where we can use an epistemic modal like must it's almost it's it's often true that we can also just say the unmodalized sentence so i can say in all the contexts where it's cool it's good for me to say it must be raining or the dog must have eaten his food i can probably also say it's raining the dog ate his food so speakers have a choice and both are felicitous so that I think contributes, I think something about that, and it's not quite clear what, contributes to the loss of these modals. So the more they get used epistemically, the more the communicative um, competition is with not saying a modal at all. And in fact, if you, if you look at the, the study that I didn't go through, but is in the slides, which I'll post on my website, um, we find that kids in those exact contexts where both are okay to say, you have indirect evidence, you could say a modal, but you don't have to. Kids don't. Adults do. Kids don't. Yeah. Okay. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, Giuseppe wants to know uh, whether there are any similar studies on romance varieties uh, where similar uh, polysemy is found. Um, not yet. So one of um, one of my so my co-author on the paper was my PhD supervisor in Toronto, and, um, and, and um, so Ana Teresa Perez Larou, and one of her current students is a Brazilian Portuguese speaker, and she is currently running a version of this task in Brazilian Portuguese. I don't know the results yet, but I'm very excited to soon find out. Um, she, of course, got disrupted in data collection because of everything happening. Um, so not yet, but stay tuned. 
Okay, um, Claudia wants to know uh, whether you repeated uh, the experiments with older speakers. Yeah, that would have been my uh, question too. Do you think school education can affect the interpretation when there's no overt aspectual marking? That was exactly what I was saying. Yes, yes. I think that's a, that's an excellent question and something um, I would like to eventually do, um, which is, um, and especially because it's very, very, very relevant for the sociolinguistic theory, like do teenagers do it? Do teenagers do it even more? Um, so I would love to run this um, again with a wider range of speakers, um, particularly, you know, uh, seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 11-year-olds. I'd really, that's my main interest is kind of that transition from childhood to um, uh, teenhood because my expertise is on child language development, but most of the sociolinguistic literature that talks about contributions to incrementation looks at older mm -hmm. teenagers. So 17-year-olds are like, that's the cool age in sociolinguistics because they're the ones who are supposed to do things the most <laughs> before the new right. thing the most. Yeah. Right, your young adults were 18 to 25. That's not very far beyond that. So, uh, right, maybe there is some kind of swinging back a bit through education. I don't know. I think so. And this, uh, oh, where is it? Sorry, that's not the right experiment. I want to show you something. So this was the results, right? So this adult, the one who was at ceiling, was our youngest speaker, our youngest sure. adult speaker. Okay. Yeah. So Levin uh, wants to know whether you think uh, the overgeneralization effect around age five uh, is in any way related to the development of uh, theory of mind. Mm, interesting. Um, so I, my first instinct is to say no, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and the, the reason is because it's a bit late um, for, for the way we might think theory of mind would affect uh, modal reasoning. Um, so that is that there's a big milestones in theory of mind development around age two, um, which are probably more related to the root modal uses. Um, and then there's another major milestone around age four, um, which has to do with false belief reasoning and belief reasoning, um, but involves but it's more about like me being able to infer what Anna th on thinks, right? Like, so I think that Anna thinks that I know, you know, being able to do that kind of uh, reasoning and language and, and being able to pass um, various types of false belief tasks. However, um, in English, all of these are, these are all monoclausal constructions. So children have the grammatical capacity and we've seen from um, naturalistic studies and then studies about just um, possibility reasoning and epistemic reasoning, that everything that they seem to require is actually a little easier, a little earlier than that false belief reasoning, which note has an added layer of complexity because you are attributing a false belief to the matrix subject. So um, Anne thinks there's milk in the fridge. There's not, she's wrong, <laughs> right? Even though I said milk in the fridge, yeah. Um, so, so that milestone, being able to pass those false belief tasks is around age four. Um, but it's, uh, but those tasks I think involve more than a plain epistemic modal. And even those harder tasks are already passed by kids, are already a year behind the kids um, who are doing this uh, epistemic incrementation in our study. Um, also, the, the Bosnian uh, children we studied, we had more older kids, more six-year-olds, and they were doing it even more than the five-year-olds um, in that study. Okay. I uh, also had two more questions. Um, watching the, uh, the chat, but uh, for now, there's no new questions. Mm -hmm. The first thing I noticed uh, right on slide two and then again on slide 10 is that you seem to use a different intonation when you use the epistemic reading. Now, I was wondering what Penguin did. Yes. Um, <laughs> intonation is like very understudied for modal interpretations. Um, um, I'm hoping somebody who knows a lot more about um, phonetics will. Students, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I would talk to the students. I said, are you listening? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, 
<laughs> yes, exactly. It's a really, it's a good area to get into. It would be useful for many other people. So we would all be like, yes, yeah, study it. We'll give you money if, if, <laughs> if we were granting. Um, okay. So yes, I think there are some differences in the, in the prosody um, for the natural usage of um, these modal verbs in these sentences, right? Um, I was exaggerating to try to give the meanings. You know, I was really playing up the prosody. Um, so for, um, for what Penguin said, it was always pre-recorded. So for every sentence that, you know, participants heard, it was always the same sentence for, for um, across the speakers. And, um, and we actually uh, recorded it and it was, it was just me talking, um, but we recorded many, many versions and tried to get ones that sounded um, both natural and critically for the modal only ones could arise, could give rise to either interpretation. Um, so Irina must take a bath. So not Irina must take a bath, like no, no yeah, stress, yeah. no focusing, um, just a, a natural prosody, but one that doesn't to the best of our abilities, and we and I tried it out on people, doesn't give away one reading over the other. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I was wondering, if there are no other questions. Um, so in English or in Toronto English, um, the availability and the acquisition of grammatical aspect uh, pushes the the epistemic bias forward so mm -hmm. once uh, aspect is acquired um the epistemic bias kicks in basically yeah that's yeah. what you said what uh, have you i mean you said you had to study on dutch but Dutch doesn't work so well because it also has a little bit of aspect but uh what about a language like german that doesn't do grammatical aspect marking so yes um so i don't know about german but i'll tell you more about the dutch study so we looked okay. at um, so this is a study by, uh, so uh, myself and Valentin Hakau are last authors, and the two first authors are Anne-Marie van Doren and Maxime Tulling, two native speakers of Dutch. And we used the Groningen corpus, um, and we compared it to our English work, and we, and we were asking, you know, what's in the input signal that would give away root, geontic, or epistemic interpretation um, for these modal verbs? Um, and while Dutch does have some, uh, the progressive, right? There's some progressive yeah. aspect marking. It was very, very infrequent. Um, so compared to the English input, where we do see a, you know, a significant amount of utterances with modal, these, the auxiliary modal verbs in English have aspect marking in them, it, the Dutch equivalents um, don't. Um, but what is really reliable is making it a, a a higher level distinction between stative and eventive. Yeah. So you'll notice that in the English data here, all of our verbs are eventive verbs, take a bath, eat, um, wear boots, uh, wear rain boots. Um, they're all eventive verbs. And what happens um, when you put grammatical aspect on them is you transform them into states. He has, he's in a state of having eaten. He's in the state of taking it. She's in the state of taking a bath. Um, so if you look at it that way, if you draw the distinction between is the predicate that the modal is um, associated with eventive or stative, then Dutch and English looked exactly alike. You get epistemic uses with statives and um, root uses with events. More often, it's not super clean, um, but we were, but in that one, we were looking at, you know, can kids learn from the input? And what about the input might allow children to work out that must or mutant have two meanings? Um, and, and we uh, propose that it's probably stativity. So in Dutch, um, and this is also true in English, um, you get the verb to be a lot with it, must be, right? Um, and that's the epistemic uses. So it's, it's really about stativity. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions from the audience? No? I'm getting late in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's late, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll make one more quick Dutch comment, which might be uh, interesting for the um, uh, Flemish speakers. Um, 
We also found that there seemed to be fewer uses by the adults of epistemic, epistemic uses of these modal verbs that we were looking at, which were like mütten, um, zahlen, zullen, yeah, zullen, zullen, yeah, okay, and können. Um, we were looking at all of these, um, and there were fewer overall. And so part of what we think is also there's those particles, right? Like the, um, yeah. they'll, right? Um, so we think that, you know, the epistemic work might be di divided up a little differently in Dutch than English, even though they have all these cognate um, felicimus modal verbs. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. I really no more questions. And then I will thank you very much for coming and for jumping in at such short notice and having such a cool uh, presentation ready in like, three weeks time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you so much. I see from the comments uh, that people thought it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? Just thank you for coming and for this exciting talk. I also, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting me. And I just saw Leifen is here. I, I heard you say Leifen before, but yeah, I, exactly. I didn't. Yeah, exactly. the question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it was the, the same Leifen I knew, but Leifen, I should have been yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was really a pleasure. Um, and I will share the slides along and post them uh, on my website as well. Thank you uh, very much. And I'm always happy to answer further questions if people want to email me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, then, um, good uh, afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and good night. Um, All right. Happy Bye, holidays. everyone. Bye. Bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you.